I think consistency um, and not always used. Um, this was my take from some of that there as well. I suppose another bit that struck me was just how critical it is to have tools or, or, or other things that can be used to help officers in a custody environment, yet there's investment around that. I was struck by the comment actually where investment is done by police officers programming computer in their own time, which doesn't strike me as being perhaps the, the significant investment that's required <coughs> from there. And the last part for me was very much around the evaluation and the need to evaluate these tools to make sure they work. And I suspect as these tools are rolled out, there'll be more use of them, there'll be more data and better evaluation to tweak them. So there are some things that we can pick up from that. So I suppose in terms of just taking us through the journey of our questions today, um, having uh, spoken about the need for and tools to identify um, those who uh, are in need of support, we then talk about how do we support people who then come into that custody environment. Um, and a great privilege to uh, introduce Suzanne Smith, um, Suzanne is a registered intermediate from Northern Ireland. Um, she graduated from the University of Ulster as a speech and language therapist in 1994. Uh, since this time she has worked in adult learning disability services as a speech and language therapist. And that's included working in regional specialist hospital for adults with learning disabilities in Northern Ireland. In 2013 she completed training and went on to become one of the first registered intermediates in Northern Ireland. And she continues to work as a senior specialist speech and language therapist <coughs> and a registered intermediate. So again, someone with lots of experience, I'm sure, will help inform our, our decisions and talk today. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Thank you. I just want to be doing that and say thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's lovely to be here, to come across the water to speak to you all. Um, I'm a speech and language therapist by background, and so work as a speech and language therapist, and um, I'm also one of the registered intermediaries in Northern Ireland, so it's great to be here today talking to you um, about this at your conference. So the registered intermediaries in Northern Ireland, and the scheme in Northern Ireland is slightly different from the scheme in England and Wales. It has only been going for just coming up on four years, and the, the main difference is that we, um, we support um, all vulnerable people, whether they are... Um, a suspect or defendant or a witness or a victim, it, it makes no difference to us in England and Wales. It's only um, witnesses and um, suspect and <coughs> witnesses and um, victims who, who are um, uh, covered by the registered scheme. So it's slightly different in Northern Ireland. So in Northern Ireland then, why are we using intermediaries? Um, you know, what's what's the, the sort of the, the goal behind it? Well, in, in Northern Ireland, um, the hope is that registered intermediaries will make, help make the criminal justice system accessible to some of the most vulnerable people in our society. I think that's one of the things that has really come through really strongly from the Malawi's talk this morning, just about the fairness of it, and that's really what, what we want to help achieve. And in some cases, the use of, of a registered intermediary, an RI, has been the difference between a victim or a witness being able to testify or not. It has also um, assisted vulnerable defendants in having a fair trial, which I think is something which, which we're all keen to, to, um, to push forward with. So obviously the legislation in Northern Ireland is, is different from <coughs> here and also different from England and Wales again. But you know there is the legislation there. I'm not going to take time to go into it. I just want to be doing that and say thank you very much for inviting me. It's, it's lovely to be here to come across the water to speak to you all. Um, I'm a speech and language therapist by background and so work as a speech and language therapist and um, I'm also one of the registered intermediaries in Northern Ireland so it's great to be here today talking to you um, about this at your conference. So the registered intermediaries in Northern Ireland and the scheme in Northern Ireland is slightly different from the scheme in England and Wales. It has only been going for just coming up on four years and the, the main difference is that we, um, we support um, all vulnerable people whether they are um, a suspect or defendant or a witness or a victim, it, it makes no difference to us in England and Wales. It's only um, witnesses and um, suspect and <coughs> witnesses and um, victims who, who are um, uh, covered by the registered scheme. So it's slightly different in Northern Ireland. So in Northern Ireland then, why are we using intermediaries? Um, you know, what's what's the, the sort of the, the goal behind it? Well, in, in Northern Ireland, um, the hope is that registered intermediaries will make, help make the criminal justice system accessible to some of the most vulnerable people in our society. I think that's one of the things that has really come through really strongly from the Malawi's talk this morning, just about the fairness of it, and that's really what, what we want to help achieve. And in some cases, the use of, of a registered intermediary, an RI, has been the difference between a victim or a witness being able to testify or not. It has also um, assisted vulnerable defendants in having a fair trial, which I think is something which, which we're all keen to, to, um, to 
for sure. So obviously the legislation in Northern Ireland is, is different from <coughs> here and also different from England and Wales again. But you know, there is the legislation there. I'm not going to take time to go into it in detail because I'm sure you can, you can get it from the slides. But there, there is um, legislation there that provides um, for the use of a registered intermediary <coughs> and um, you know, the use of live link and all of that. I'm sure you have the equivalent here. Then, you know, there's a definition of what a vulnerable witness is, and there's, again, um, probably similar um, legislation here as well. And again, I'm not going to take time to go into that, because I think you know the individuals here I'm referring to whenever I, I, I talk about the vulnerable witness. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, not, we'll not take time to go into that just today. But, basically then, if we think about the people who, who may need assistance from a registered intermediary, we are there to help communication difficulties. That, that's that's the, the, the main thing. So really whether someone has a learning disability, whether they have Asperger's syndrome, whether they have um, a brain injury, dementia, whatever it is, it really doesn't make any difference to us. It's the communication difficulty that's key. That is what we're assessing, that's what we're looking to see because it's the communication difficulty that's the barrier to them engaging fully in the criminal justice process. So um, we, we take referrals for anyone who has any kind of vulnerability who, who therefore may have communication difficulty as a result of that. And this is just a, a bit of a list of the main reasons why people are referred through. They may have um, aphasia or dysphasia, that would be maybe following a stroke or, or a head injury where they have um, you know, real difficulty getting speech out. Perhaps those on the autistic spectrum, those with a brain or a head injury, those with dementia, those with learning disability, those with mental health issues, those with um, neurological and other progressive disorders, motor neuron, Parkinson's, um, that kind of thing, and some folks with some voice disorders. We, may, we also help um, folks who are vulnerable because of their age. And it's not on this list, but this, that's actually the bulk of our referrals are actually for children, for very young children under the age of you know, four or five. We have a lot of referrals who are just vulnerable because their language hasn't developed yet. So, you know, they're only three, three or four maybe, and therefore they don't understand the language that, that you or I would understand. So anyone who has any kind of communication difficulty that's going to be a barrier to them taking part in any part of the criminal justice system, they are a very appropriate person to be referred through to us. And those are the reasons, those are the reasons why. So who are we then? Who are the registered intermediaries? Well, we are um, professionals with special skills in communication. We work for the Department of Justice um, on a self-employed basis. So I'm on annual leave today as a speech therapist, so I'm on annual leave. Um, so at the moment in Northern Ireland, there are 21 of us registered as intermediaries, and we're coming from um, mostly from a speech and language therapy background and also some from a social work background. We're obviously subject to code of practice and code of ethics and procedural guidance to follow. So the principles of RI practice then just to give you a bit of the background of this, you know, we, we're there, we're completely neutral in the whole thing. We don't express any kind of an opinion on the truth or reliability of what the witness or defendant has said. So, you know, we're not engaging in any of that. We're there purely to support communication. At no stage do we express an opinion as to whether we think the defendant is guilty or not guilty. Again, we're there purely for communication. We are impartial, neutral, objective and transparent and our duty is to the court. So sometimes it's easier said than done, but we're, 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 our paramount duty you know, it is to, to the court. And we're there to facilitate communication. That's exactly what we are. We're there as a, as a tool, really, to, to facilitate communication during the police investigation stage, which is obviously the stage you're, you're more interested in today. And also we follow that on through. We follow that on through to, um, to the court stage. Um, so we're there through the whole process. Um, ideally, it's the same one of us. We're there through the whole process. So just to, to give you a bit of an overview of our involvement you know, from start to finish and then we'll pick at certain parts of it and, and go into more detail at certain parts of it. So the first thing we do um, is whenever we're involved with someone or whenever we, we have a referral for someone and I'll, I'll talk a bit about the background of that in a second but we'll conduct an assessment of the person's communication needs. Okay, So even if that's in a custody suite um, at a weekend or an evening, that's fine as well. We um, have a call out service. So excuse me, we will do an assessment of the person's communication abilities and needs. Then, what we will do is we will, and that's hopefully, sorry, in a custody suite or in a, if it's someone who's a suspect in a case, that will hopefully be in the presence of their solicitor, okay? As an intermediary, because I am um, impartial and, and neutral in the whole thing, I don't want to be turned into a witness in a case, so um, we have to have someone with us at all times. 
So if it's um, someone who is a suspect in a case, um, we need someone there. And the, the best person to have there is their solicitor. Because if we have the, the police there, and obviously they're not under caution when we're doing our assessment, and they, they, you know, the individual maybe discloses something, that obviously puts everyone in a very difficult position. So um, we, would have the, oh, we would have their solicitor there. And I, and I picked up on something that some people were saying this morning about not always having a solicitor. That's the first thing we would always say. If there's no solicitor there, we would be very loath to continue with an assessment of the person's communication skills. And we would be making sure that that person understands the importance of having a solicitor there. Because it may, whilst it may have been explained to them, it may not have been explained to them in language that they can understand. So we make sure that they understand the importance of that. So we then, once we've done an assessment of the person's communication skills, if it's a suspect in a case, we will then provide the police who's the investigating officer with some sort of preliminary report just to enable planning for the interview. Now ideally, you're not all doing this in one sitting, but obviously if it's in a custody suite it has to happen really quickly, well that's okay as well. Um, we would do a very quick preliminary, it might be an oral report, and we might scribble down a few things. <coughs> ideally, you maybe have done your assessment, and you're bringing the person back in for questioning and we've had a chance to sit down with the police officer and really go through our assessment findings and really go through planning of the interview and planning of the questions and looking at the vocabulary and looking at you know, the type of props that, that might help, if, if any. So that's, that's the idea. So we do our assessment, we do some sort of a preliminary report or some sort of a feedback session and help the police to plan for that interview. Um, we then sit in on that interview and if we feel that the person is not understanding or if we feel that there is vocabulary or language being used that the person you know, isn't able to understand or there's anything happening that, that they're not understanding or we can help in any way, we're jumping in and we're, we're trying to assist. And that can take in various forms, that can be drawings, that can be use of picture material, lots of different things and that's it, we'll talk about that in detail. Then once the, the um, the investigation stage is over, um, we kind of get another referral then, it's usually a couple of years on, I'm not sure how long it takes for police to come to court in Scotland, in Northern Ireland it's taken quite a while at the moment, so the person is referred back to us then, and we then sort of review, the, we do the whole process again, really we take, we, why don't we review that person's communication skills, because they may have changed, you know, sometimes two, three years on, and I'm reviewing someone's communication skills, so, um, you know, a child obviously is going to get a bit older. Someone with a brain injury, you know, it might have got worse, it might have got a bit better. Someone with a progressive disorder, with a neuron Parkinson's, it might have got a bit worse. So we're reviewing their communication skills so that the court, the report that we send to court, is absolutely as up to date as it can be. It details their communication skills exactly as they are at that moment. So in the court report, then we we then that goes to the court, and um, we then have what's called a ground rules hearing where advocates from both sides agree the rules that we have laid out for communication and agree um, basically how to question the individual. And then when they, just as we have in the police um, interview, we're there then. We are there, present then, sorry, when the person gives their evidence, we're in the box with them, or if it's a, um, a witness, we're up in the, in the light link room with them, and that has hopefully all been agreed as well. So that's kind of an overview of what we do. We're not an investigator, we're not a second interviewer, we're not an interpreter, we're not an expert witness, um, we're not an advocate or a supporter for the witness or the defendant, um, and we're not an appropriate adult. There's an appropriate adult scheme in Northern Ireland, and similar I'm sure to what you have here, and there would be an appropriate adult present as well as us um, in, in the case of um, a suspect in a case. So we're not any of those things. So, Thinking then, how does it actually work in practice? What, what way does it work? Those people who are on the ground who may want to use the, the, the scheme. So they talk about the end user. So the end user is perhaps someone in the police, or it can also be at the other end of it, where maybe the person has only come to light um, at the, the, court, so the court stage. So PPS is the Public Prosecution Service in Northern Ireland. <coughs> the defence solicitor may identify that someone has a communication difficulty. And I know that's something you've been thinking about this morning. And Dr. McKinnon was talking about, you know, um, how does the police or how does anybody identify um, a communication difficulty? And I know Tony also asked me to speak about that, and I did trail around a lot of police colleagues and say, well, how do you, how do you know who to refer through to us? And um, they basically, I think, don't really know how to refer through to us. And in, in the initial stages of our pilot, 
um, we were getting all sorts of weird and wonderful referrals. But I have to say, we've done a lot of training, and we have, um, you know, worked a lot with them, and they have now got to know who to refer through to. So we get very few inappropriate referrals, I have to say. And sometimes we get a referral for someone who does have a learning disability or does have some sort of communication disability, <coughs> and um, it, it's been an appropriate referral. But maybe we can't, you know, we can't even help with that. Maybe their communication isn't at a level where they can't, um, they couldn't really participate in a police interview. That happens quite a lot or maybe, maybe they don't need us at all. So um, the, the referrals are generally quite, quite appropriate, we feel um, now, sort of coming up on four years on. So we then, the importance of getting the information right though, I suppose, is that, that we get at that referral stage, is if the end user um, puts something on it that isn't accurate. So for example, if, if they tick, in the early days of the scheme, they would have just sort of ticked all the boxes, you know, so someone might have aphasia, autism, you know, um, apraxia, they might have had everything on the list, you know, the police would have just ticked down through everything on the list and that might have got the service there a little bit quicker because they ticked everything. So we did a little bit of training and, you know, pointed out to people in a very nice way that really that's not very helpful for us. And the reason that that's not helpful is because we want to try and <coughs> write registered intermediary to that person, okay? For example, if someone was referred through the service who had a brain injury, I am not going to be the best registered intermediary to help them because my experience is in learning disability. So we have intermediaries who are specialists in all the different areas. So if, if you refer someone through who's a brain injury, you, you really want someone who has that background information, you know, and who works in that field and who's an expert in that field. So that's really the reason why we, we, we like that information to be as accurate as possible. And it just means that you have a person with the necessary skill set to, to deal with it, hopefully. So they put in the, the end user, if it's in, in, in the case of, we talked about this morning, for example, a custody officer or a police officer investigating the case, um, refers through, and um, we would very quickly then contact them, as I said, to um, seven day a week service, bank holidays, evenings included, and they would phone one of us, and if, it's, if someone's in custody and, and it needs to be done quickly, we would, we, we would go down there and do our assessment and, and do everything that needs to be done there. Um, when I did put this, this slide in because Tony had asked me, you know, how did we identify? We did a lot of initial training four years ago when the scheme started. We um, did lots of initial training with police at all levels um, and we have ongoing awareness raising sessions with ourselves and that's included as part of specialist training. So any new detectives that are being trained have a session with us. Anyone who's coming new to, um, to any of the the sort of the, the, I'm sure you have the same, the child abuse investigation units or the rape crime units, the public protection units, similar here, I'm sure, maybe not called the same titles, but we would do a lot of training with, with those individuals because that's where we have seen the bulk of our referrals coming from. So we would do that, we would also do, just as I mentioned, some specialist training around autistic spectrum disorder, and I've done a little bit on learning disabilities um, as well, when sort of specific training has been asked for. We keep doing this awareness raising and promotion of the schemes at each rollout of the RI scheme and we are re we're going to be moving into the Magistrates Court for the first time in Northern Ireland in April of this year. So we're in the middle of another rollout of training and again hopefully every time we do a rollout we catch people who we maybe haven't caught before. We're displaying posters about the role of the RI and there's a detailed police service guide on the RI schemes apparently. <laughs> so there we are. So, if we just take it back then, what's actually do an assessment? Because I know that's something that someone has asked as well. What do I actually do? So when someone is, is referred to me and I you know, go in, whether it's at the custody stage or at the, the court stage they're about to go to court, I would do the same thing. And to be honest with you, it's a very similar assessment to the assessment I would do as a speech and language therapist uh, with a few little tweaks. The first thing I'm doing is, you know, obviously establishing rapport with, with the vulnerable person in, in order to carry out the assessment and assist them. And I'm really looking to see, do they need an RI, RI assistance? And am I the right person to help them? And <coughs> I really then want to do a full assessment of their communication needs and abilities. So I will do um, the same type of assessment I do as a speech and language therapist, as I've said. And as any good speech and language therapist will do, I will always start with their understanding. So I'll start with um, <coughs> what they understand. And I'll start and I'll, I'll you know, pick that apart. Um, I do tend to use some formal assessment tools. Um, those of you who are interested, I tend to use an assessment called the TROG, the Test of Perception of Grammar, which is a standardised assessment. I also sometimes use a DPBS, 
Gillette's, which is the British Picture Vocabulary Skills. We've just found this scheme being quite new in Northern Ireland, that um, when we go to court, and um, the, the judge, uh, we're in front of the judge, you know, explaining our, our report and explaining our involvement, that advocates from the other side will very often say, well, why did you use this tool, or what tool did you use? They're questioning our assessments. So because it's so new in Northern Ireland, um, they're, they're kind of taking everything apart. So we're, we're using, um, so we are tending to use some more formal assessments than perhaps our colleagues in England and Wales. I think they're, they're getting, well not getting away, but they're, they're using a lot more informal um, stuff because they've been, they've been on the go for longer, but we're, we're still using a lot of formal assessments. So I'm looking to see um, you know, what the person's understanding is like. And I am drilling right down into that. I am looking to see um, how many elements in a sentence they can understand. So any of you that have ever maybe been involved, you know, in, in any training around communication, um, you know, can they understand, you know, one element in a sentence? Can they understand two? Can they understand three? Um, can they understand complicated vocabulary? And what I mean by that is words like prepositions, in, on, under, beside, between. Um, you know, they might not seem complicated to your eye, but those are quite complicated concepts. Can they understand before and after? Can they understand comparative elements? Bigger, smaller, taller, fatter, thinner, that kind of thing. Can they understand um, you know, abstract words? How did you feel? Um, happy, sad, was angry, frightened, those sorts of um, abstract things, which we know our folks with autistic spectrum disorder find really difficult. So we're looking at all of that. We're looking at maybe their understanding of negatives. That's a classic, um, you know, where you say to someone, um, don't turn on the light or something, and they then just hear turn on the light and flick on the light. So we're assessing all of that and looking in the absolute detail of what they can and can't understand. We're looking also at, um, sorry I'm jumping around a bit in this list because it's in a funny kind of an order, but we're looking at um, their likely response to open and close questions. Are they always agreeing? I think that was mentioned early, earlier. Are they just acquiescing to everything that's said? You know, if I ask them a load of questions, are they just saying yes? You know, if I often say, Oh, I came here by bus today, didn't I? And I'll smile and nod, and they'll smile and nod with me. So even to report that back, you know, is, is really good. Um, and I, I, look at, I look at all of that. And I also then begin then, once I've looked at their understanding, I look at how they're expressing themselves. So I look at, um, are they using speech? Are they maybe a signer? Maybe, a, um, maybe pointing to picture materials? Does that help pointing to things around the room? Um, if they're using speech, what is their speech like? Again, I'll drill down into that, and I'll probably use, again, the Scottish assessment, the Renfrew Reaction Picture Test. It's not really an adult learning disability assessment, but it's quick, so I therefore do use it. And it assesses, are they marking past tenses? Are they marking future tenses? You know, are they putting um, the object in their sentence, or are you having to kind of work out who they're talking about? Are they mixing up pronouns? Again, a common in um, autistic spectrum disorder. So I'm looking at the real detail of all of that so that I can feed all of that back um, to the police. I'll also look, sorry, can they sequence, can they sequence an event, what they did this morning, you know, from when they get up to when they come out, or what they did, if it's maybe a, an offence that happened a while ago, and um, you know, can you tell what they did on Christmas, for example, what they did from the morning to the evening, because if they don't do that, well then they'll not be able to sequence. So from all of that, I will then make some recommendations. So once I've worked out what they can and can't do, I will make some recommendations. And I'll make these in, in, all, in both reports. So there's a report done at preliminary stage, whether at the police, police station or you know, the being interviewed by the police, and there's a report done at the court stage. So obviously, at the custody, if they're in custody, we don't have a lot of time to do this, but I will be definitely sitting down with the police officer who's going to be doing the interview <coughs> and feeding all this back to them. Okay? Um, and I'll be telling them how the questions should be put to their, um, their suspect. You know, and helping them. I'm only there to help. I'm not there to, to criticise. You know, and I, I always make that really clear. I'm not here to you know to to criticise what what they're doing. I'm only here to help and, and as a tool. So so use me. And I have to say, the police do use me. You know, and that they use that. And I think we're really grateful for that. So I'll um, pull out what I have found. So for example, if I find that asking too many questions too quickly <coughs> is too much for this individual, I'll probably go quite quickly in my assessment just to see how they cope. Um, and I'll, I'll push and I'll push and I'll push and I'll see how long I can keep them going for before I lose them. So um, I'm a bit of a hard taskmaster. So I'll see if I can go for half an hour, for example, before the person starts yawning and looking at their watch and looking out the window. And if I can go for half an hour without that, well then that's great, then I can tell the police that. But if I can only go for 20 minutes before that happens, 
well then that's really good, I can say that. You know, we can only go for 20 minutes here or you'll lose this person. So I'll tell them all of that, the types of, que types of questions to, to avoid, you know, if they don't understand, in, on, under, beside, between, if they don't understand, um, you know, negatives, don't do their did you not, that type of thing. If they do idioms, you know, I'll, if it's a higher level person living <coughs> on the autistic spectrum, I'll be testing, do they understand things like pull your socks up, it's raining cats and dogs, all the classics, um, because, you know, the police use those types of things as well. So I'd be advising them to avoid all of those types of things in their in their questions. You know, I had a police, uh, I was in a police interview once, and the police said, police one said, um, without thinking, I wasn't without thinking, he just said, okay, let's go on. And of course, what did the person do with autistic spectrum disorder? What did he do? Yeah, got up and went to go. And of course, that caused a whole drama in the custody suite when he got up to, to go. But the police officer had said, let's, let's go on or let's move on. So, you know, you need to be really careful of things like that. So I was again able to advise, you know, on things like that. Not in a, you shouldn't have said that kind of way, but that's why he did that. It wasn't that he was, you know, trying to, you know, avoid your question or, you know, engage in this dreadful behaviour or anything. It was just that you said to him, let's go on. So he did literally do what you said. So I'd also then give practical tips and strategies. You know, if someone maybe can't understand the sequencing of maybe a day and maybe draw it out, maybe a timeline or something like that. And um, we have developed so many resources in Northern Ireland to help explain things like the caution. And um, I did bring it with me. I'll not take time to, to show it to you, but we have broken that down into picture material and you know, one word or one line at a time. We've broken all of that down and explaining. That, that, that their, their evidence is recorded and that the recording goes to court and you know all of that kind of thing. So um, I, I'll advise maybe on, on supporting it with some sort of picture material. Um, I'll advise on breaks, how often the breaks should occur and how long they should last for. And maybe if something has come up and there's maybe special vocabulary that somebody uses for something, you know, maybe they call, for example, the classic is body parts, you know, if they call them something that's maybe not the correct, um, you know, correct term that has maybe come up when I've been chatting or assessing, I'll, I'll pass that information on. Maybe even things like avoiding a certain tone of voice or you know, things like that, or not expecting the person maybe to make eye contact with you, that it's not that they're being rude, that they just find that really, really difficult. So I'll advise on all of that, and hopefully you know, that, that will then make the interview flow so much better and make it much easier for the individual. So when I'm in the interview then, we'll hopefully, as I've said, had a meeting to discuss, agree and plan <coughs> how to do it. And, um, you know, in, including the best way to initiate the account. I suppose this isn't really an issue with, um, with suspects, but more so with um, victims, where, you know, you always have to be really careful how you um, get them to initiate the account. And also, or possibly more so with victims, um, the approach to covering truth and lies. Again, we have... We have um, materials, I don't know if any of you have seen them, maybe those of you who may be working um, with victims as well, you know, about understanding of truth and lies, because these are quite abstract concepts, and folks find those very difficult, but we do need to prove, or have show that, that we have asked the person, you know, are you telling the truth, and that they know they have to tell the truth during an interview. So again, we have, we have lots of little tools up our sleeve that, um, you know, we're, we're using um, to, to help the, the police with that. So really, again, the whole thing of the interview is we're there to advise, we're there to assist. We quite often jump in, we draw things, we, we have picture material, we do whatever it needs, really. We can sometimes stop the interview if we feel that the person really isn't understanding, if they need maybe, uh, we have cutouts of red buttons on the table to say stop, things like that. Um, anything we can think of doing. And sometimes it's even, we find that it's not even um, the language that's used in the interview, it's even how the interview is conducted. The busyness of the custody suite can be the issue. The having to wait in the custody suite, the lighting in the custody suite, and whilst there's a limit to what we can do about that, um, <coughs> there have been occasions where we've had some really supportive police officers who have maybe gone to a quieter custody suite rather than the one that's the closest, because it's it's really really busy. So they've maybe gone to a quiet one, um, where there's not going to be a lot of folks around, you know, and that has that has made a real real difference for some folks. So, um, as I've said, I've probably said all of this, I'm sure that the language is uh, used by the interviewer is appropriate and it follows the recommendations. And if it doesn't follow the recommendations, we have a duty to make sure it follows the recommendations because we've written that in a report. And recently I had a case that came to court and it was, it was a victim, but the court were very keen, the defence were very keen to point out that I hadn't followed my own rules or I had allowed the police to break some of the rules. Very slightly, I have to say, and it wasn't 
that they were trying to, to confuse anybody. Things just slip out because we're all human, you know. Um, so, you know, we, we have a duty to that, and if it's in a report, we, we find that that's come, kind of coming back on us, so we will jump in. As I said, we are supporting language, we're using pictures, photos, whatever, and we're providing a means for the interview, interviewee to communicate difficult concepts. For example, things like prepositions, we're maybe having figures, and we're maybe getting people to place the things, you know, in, on, under, beside, between. Whatever it takes, we're, we're doing it. So then, um, once the, the investigation stage is over, we probably don't see the individual for a while, in case you know that it is a couple of years, and we are then back in doing the assessment again, and there's a court report prepared. So it's a similar report to the police report, um, the, the report to in, inform the police how best to interview. It's really to inform the court how best to, to question as well. It's also though used um, when the uh, use of registered intermediary is a special measure. So, um, the um, counsel for the other side can object to us being there and object to us assisting the individual. So our report is used primarily in the first instance to, um, you know, so the folks can say yes, we agree to an intermediary as a special measure, or no, we don't. And hopefully, if they agree to using us as a special measure, it's then the, the main thing is it's to advise the prosecution, defence, and the judge how best to communicate with this individual during the trial. So I've just put up some sort of an excerpt from a court report because I just want you to see the detail really that goes into it and the detail that we're getting people to agree to. So I mean I've, I've sort of, there's three, four slides and this is just an excerpt from it. But at the end, is that my first one? At the end we have this grid. Okay, so we, we assess the person's communication skills and at the end we summarise it. So we go through, as I say, the minute detail. So we tell them what to do and then how to help with it. So for example, this individual had a difficulty with sequencing, okay, you see the first bit. So what we're saying to the person who's questioning this individual called Ryan is when, when, when he's being questioned about the alleged incidents, refer to the specific subject areas that Ryan may understand better. So talk about the old house or the new house, you know, talk about when he was at the caravan or when he was getting sweets. Use, you know, use, use specific, um, specific subject areas to help him. You, know, you can see it goes on here, and um, even if we flip down to the last one on this page, allow um, Ryan time after each question to allow him to process the information and to respond. So I'm saying earlier, I think it was Alan about how the questions are being fired at him. Well, we're spelling it out, we're saying here, wait for six seconds to allow him time to process. Um, sorry, I'm jumping about a bit here, but using direct questions instead of abstract questions. Don't say, tell me what happened. Say, what did so-and-so do, or did so-and-so say anything? So we're going through real detail, you can see I'm not going to take the time to go into each of these um, sort of recommendations, but at a ground rules hearing in court we're going through every one of these and if we are questioned on them, you know, we can then go back to our assessment and say, well, you know, we're saying, you know, for example, if we look at that last one, or if we look at the last two, if we look at um, the last one for first, check that Ryan understands the before and after, if they're used during questioning, and I'm suggesting a timeline there, you know, if, if the said to me in court, well, why on earth do we need a timeline, um, you know, don't understand this. I'd be able to flick in my report and say, well, actually, you know, he needs a timeline because I have assessed his understanding of before and after, and it's dodgy. So therefore, if it's presented pictorially, you know, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, it does away with the need for that complicated language, and it really helps. So I'm, I'm able to kind of justify my position and justify why I'm saying that. The, the one about that, if you look, be aware that if Ryan smiles or giggles, it's not that he's finding the situation funny or being disrespectful. You have that as a sign that, that Ryan is nervous and uncomfortable that he doesn't understand. So we're, we're highlighting all the issues. I'm not going to take time to, to go through them all. But you know, we're highlighting all of the issues that we have in terms of communication and how best to, um, to assist with them. And we're getting both sides to agree in court. So what we don't do, though, is we don't examine or cross-examine. We, we can't protect from distressing questions. If the person's asked a question which is difficult, which is nothing, we can't do anything about that. And we can't change the substance or interpret the evidence. We can help rephrase a question, or we can help you know, make it easier for the person to understand, but we can't change you know, the, the, the substance or what they actually need to get. And as I say, we don't act for the prosecution or for the defence. We're responsible to the court, and we're an officer of the court. So finally, just um, some figures and things. I'm just very aware of the time that we're already running over. So, um, 
the, scheme, the pilot scheme in Northern Ireland was launched um, in May 2013. And um, I just pulled some figures here. I just pulled the top figures because I thought you'll not be interested in wading through all of them. But from May 2013 till December, just past December 2016, there have been over 12,000 requests for an RI. And again, I pulled the top three here. So, um, or, come on, that a minute. Sorry, 80% of, right, of the requests were for victims and witnesses, and 20% were for suspects and defendants. Okay, and that was in the last year, 80% and 20. That changed from when we first started four years ago. When we first started four years ago, it was more like a 90 10 split, where we were being used much more for witnesses and victims in the early days of the scheme. Now we think um, solicitors and um, you know the legal profession are maybe realising that perhaps this is a really good way of, of helping their individuals and it, it's, it's fairer. Um, so we're getting a lot more referrals through from solicitors actually than um, we would have before. Um, so it's more like an 80-20 split now. We, um, so the top reasons why someone is referred to an RI, the top three reasons, 40% of cases involve those under 10 years. Okay, so that the most common reason for the of vulnerability is age, really. Um, you know, that, that, is, that is the most common. 30% of cases involve those with a learning disability. 13% of cases involve those with autistic spectrum disorder. Obviously, we have all of the other difficulties that, that we have been mentioned here this morning, brain injury and um, progressive disorders as well. But those are the three most common. Young age, learning disability, autistic spectrum disorder, those are the three most common. Okay. Then again, the top three here, 50% of cases are sexual offences, okay, and that's across the board. It made no difference, um, or very little difference between the, um, the suspects and the victims. So 50% of cases were sexual offences, 30% of cases involved assault, and 10% of cases involved cruelty. So it was the same across the board. And again, those were the top reasons. There were lots of others um, you know, below that, but I, I just I didn't, I didn't think you'd walk it over. The minute detail of it, that's, that's the, the, the top three. And from the April of this year then, we're to move to the Magistrates Court. We had previously just been in the Crown Courts. So we're to move to the Magistrates Court. So um, we're doing some training actually this week with the Magistrates um, prior to that. So really that's kind of the end of my presentation. I'll put a phone number on there. Um, you know, I'm sure that the, the Department of Justice in Northern Ireland is very happy for any of you to, to phone them with a query. Um, you know, I know we have a similar scheme here at the moment, um, but I'm sure if there are any queries that they're very happy to take um, to take you know to take that from you. <coughs> so folks, that's really all I have here. I don't know if anyone wants to ask me anything. Probably was double the rate or not. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I was just going to ask, um, do you facilitate solicitor client interviews prior to yes. police interview and if so, are you covered by legal privilege of, of non disclosure? Yes, you are. yes. Um, we are covered by legal privilege, yes. So we, and a good solicitor will, will use us for exactly that reason. The best, um, the best examples I have had is when, um, it doesn't really matter who makes a referral, but we've done the communication assessment, the solicitor has sat in for the assessment has seen just the, the extent of the person's difficulties and then I have been where, there with the solicitor as they're trying to explain to the person you know, the best way forward, whether that's maybe doing a no comment interview or whatever. And as I said, I do have this little resource that we developed in Northern Ireland, um, you know, because one of the things was, you, know, you can see we've broken down, I know you can't couldn't get it on the PowerPoint, but this is a picture of beautiful Antrim Serious Crime unit with all the lovely fortification in Northern Ireland. Um, so this is this is this is you know one of the, the main custody suits and it goes through and there's sort of one page and one line you know so we've developed this as our eyes if you are arrested you can talk to the police you know it goes through one line and I very often and um, will go through this with the solicitor and um, with the person and it, it explains them you know the caution and and then if the solicitor has you know recommendations as to how the interview should proceed and um, I can help explain that to the individual as well and that's Sometimes they put me out, sometimes the sister puts me out and they don't want me there um, for that. I mean, we do have that privilege, but um, sometimes the solicitor doesn't want me there. And obviously that's uh, not so, it, so it's accepted that at no time can you be a witness in no, any of I can't be a witness, I can't be a witness. Um, yeah, so that's, that's not okay. <coughs> Sorry, yes? But just to try and find it, um, you mentioned obviously you're there to facilitate communication, yes. uh, but then you, you also said that 
during a suspect interview, an appropriate adult would be there as well as an yes. intermediary. It's just a wee bit confusing because what would what would the two roles be? Okay. At that point. Okay. In Northern Ireland, there's um, the appropriate adult scheme is, is run by one um, group called Mindwise. So they um, they their role would would come would come very much work together. What they would say is they would do they would look after everything making sure the person's appropriate breaks, making sure that they're treated appropriately, that they get meals, that they get all of that kind of thing. But in terms of the communication part of it, um, where they're maybe, obviously they can't be as with the solicitor either because they don't have the, they could be called as a witness, so they, they're not in at that part. We can be in at that part when they can't. And in terms of um, explaining something during the interview, the appropriate adult, we've done a lot of training with them as well. They would, we, we take on that part uh, they, they don't take on that part. It's the registered intermediaries who take on the part of helping during the actual interview of explaining something. So we do work hand in hand with them. And it did take a bit of time to work out the kinks in that one. You know, I, I'm, I'm not saying that that's always perfect. It did take a bit of time to work out the kinks in it, but um, I think it's a successful partnership now. And it means that we're, we're working together and that we're, we're, we're solely concentrating on the communication where the appropriate adult is, is, is um, concerned with the whole whole thing and the whole experience while they're there. Does that, does that help? Okay, um, obviously when someone's brought into custody, it's kind of time critical, so how long would it take generally to do an assessment and thereafter speak to the officer and bring and give them the feedback and how to proceed? Okay, well we do try to work really quickly because we're, we're very aware of that. So. Um, you know, we, we can do an assessment, we can do it quickly, you know, um, it's not the ideal, obviously, but we can rattle through most of what I'm talking there about in less than an hour, and probably in, in about 45 minutes, because after 45 minutes you probably lose the first, you know, any, you'll lose any of us after about 45 minutes, whether you've learned disability or not. So we are probably doing that assessment within 45 minutes. We are then immediately um, liaising with the um, investigating officer, and you know, they're going straight in to do the interview. Um, so it's, it's it, well, it's obviously it's holding it up a little bit. Um, it's not, it's, we're not delaying it. We're not delaying it. Um, and we are going out at night and things, and you know, we're doing bank holidays and things as well. So it's not, it's not, oops, sorry. It's not, hopefully not delaying it. Okay. For somebody with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, it's superb. Yeah. And, and, and we would need it, <laughs> we need it here, please, if there's people to enter us. And only one thing to, that was going through my mind, and I wonder, um, well, for two, one, people with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder are developmentally, somewhere yes. about half of them actually, just that's not in fact, you know what I'm saying. So an 18 year old might need more appropriate services, or spoke in about a 19 year old, So that's one, so by nature of their condition, we would need. And two, confabulation. Mm -hmm. So they've got poor short term memory. And if they're asked a question when they really can't come up with the answer for whatever memory reasons, they might fill the gap with something. What well, happens with happening in a court if you really have just done that? Filled it with information that's not relevant. Well, again, that would be something I'm looking at when I'm doing an assessment. Um, I would, when I'm doing an assessment, I would, I would start as a kind of meme to go on and I would say to them, when I'm doing a couple of those assessments that I talked to you about, I would say to them, if you don't know the answer, any time you're with me, you just say don't know. Or you say stop, and I have a red button. So I say stop. So from the very beginning, that's, that's, that's the room that's set up, and that's perfect. Everybody, simple. <coughs> very beginning, that's set up. So, and then that carries right through. Go ahead, sorry. Um, has specific money been raised from the government to support this scheme, or is it the judiciary that's deciding to apportion some of its funds to support the scheme? I'm not 100% sure of that one. I know the scheme has been running in England and Wales for about 10 years, um, and I'm not sure exactly where the funding came from, to be quite honest with you. I know um, then, about four years ago, as I said, it started in Northern Ireland, I think. I think there has been money allocated, but I, I wouldn't be 100% sure of that one, so I'm sorry, I would have to get back to you on that one, but I'll find out, though, and get back to you. Hi. Um, as you know, I've worked as a registered intermediary in, uh, in London for the last couple of years, and um, I'm just really interested to think about how your referrals are matched, because you're so low in numbers, for, you know, in terms of as you are in English and I just sort of wondered how 
it sounds like obviously we didn't work specifically as registrants in ETBs with, um, with the accused, um, but I'm just sort of thinking how does it work when somebody potentially doesn't have the um, flexibility to attend a short period of time, like is there, how flexible can it be? Because I know sometimes when I would get referrals, it might, it might and it be for victims and witnesses, so probably there would have been a little bit more flexibility about about that time frame, but sometimes people could be waiting for a number of weeks before yeah. they would have somebody with availability for that specific yeah. kind of need, if you like. Well, I think in Northern Ireland, yeah, um, we have tried, I suppose, to to uh, maybe learn from some of the, the difficulties that, that are happening in England and Wales, if I can put it like that. And whilst there only are like 18 of us working at the moment, um, we, we do all referrals are matched within 24 hours in Northern Ireland. They really all are matched within 24 hours. Now, they may not be seen within 24 hours unless it's, it really is genuinely urgent, but all referrals um, are matched within 24 hours. And we have a duty to, to contact whoever that investigating officer is within 24 hours or solicitor or whoever it is within 24 hours. Um, so I, I don't think, I mean, there, there are times when it's been, it's been tight, you know, to, and maybe somebody goes off sick or something and they're, they may be due to be in court that day. Obviously that, that has happened, but we have a few individuals who are available all the time. I'm obviously not available all the time. So it's a bit of a, bit of a mix and match and a juggling exercise, to be honest with you. Um, it hasn't been easy, but I, I think that's the one thing that the Department of Justice was really keen to promote, that it, it wouldn't take wouldn't take ages to match people, that it would, it would be quick and it would be um, you know, quite, hopefully quite, whenever the people needed us, we would be there, hopefully. But then just one final question then, if we could afford to break. We heard, we heard from Alan first thing um, of how difficult it is to sustain a no comment yes. interview. And whilst, whilst I'm very much in favour of what you're doing, I do have an anxiety that by spending, say, on average an hour of engaging with someone and promoting their communication and getting them to answer <coughs> questions in your presence, that you're then setting up a sort of setting condition when you're present in the police interview that actually makes it more likely that that person will answer in the context. I just wonder about your, your thoughts around that. Possibly, and um, I suppose I have been there for a few you no know, comment interviews, and um, you know, yes, folks do find those difficult to sustain, um, and you know, that's that's that is obviously difficult. Um, but I suppose, from my point of view, I'm only there to support. I'm there to support communication, you know, um, so it, it's it's a difficulty, um, and I think it, it could potentially be a difficulty. Ideally, I don't like to do it all in one sitting, and you know, we, we would rarely have to do it in one sitting like that. Ideally we would do our assessment and then come back um, you know, and, and do the, the interview another day. You know, even, even to be honest with you with um, victims and everything, we're never keen to do it all in one sitting like that because I don't think that is a great. And we, we also like to change venue. You know, if we can do the initial um, assessment in the solicitor's office, not in the police station, that's all the better. You know, and then we can come into the police station. That, that's better, but I, I do take it away. Thank you. Any other questions? Perhaps we could be hang on to them and we'll catch up in the plenary session if we can. I'm conscious that we have one. One wee question? Okay, I'm done. Um, and these are all the other. On the PowerPoint, it was from Sunset, apparently, had since you started up the scheme, but then it's like 12,000. Sorry, 12,000, sorry. Sorry, sorry. That means you have to raise the numbers. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, the numbers on the screen are right. Just need that. Apologies. Everyone, thanks very much for being thanks to answer in. I'm not going to go, but I'm going to be fine, just come back once, I'm going to be back about...